joined now by someone who worked on many iconic productions such as Colditz, Secret Army, Survivors, Joan Hickson's Miss Marple and of course Doctor Who. Having joined in the early 60s he was there for the introduction of colour television as well as BBC Two. So I'd like to introduce production designer Austin Muddy. How are you? I'm in rude health, thank you Alex. I wanted to take you back when you encountered Doctor Who in what I think was your only sort of adventure to science fiction. I know some designers think of it as quite a challenging production. What was your experience of it? Was it a nice one to do? Well, Doctor Who uh, was great um, because I'd done a series with a director called Pennant Roberts and uh, we, we did a series called The Survivors. And then he asked me to go and do Doctor Who and um, which was something entirely different, it re required no research at all because you couldn't ask people what it was like there because no one had ever been there, you know, and you could make it up sort of thing as you went along. And um, what I do remember is that we were pretty well strapped for cash. Um, a production previous to us spent a great chunk of the overspend on the budget and I, I can remember um, having to phone the uh, production unit manager every evening, Chris Doyley John, his name was, uh, phoning him saying, today we've spent so much and so much and, uh, and totting it all up as we, as we went along. And it was, um, uh, you know, man hours, materials, what we spent on props and this kind of thing. And the episode that I did was, um, uh, the episodes uh, were uh, with Tom Baker as Doctor Who, the, the legendary Tom Baker. And it was the episode where Leela was introduced. Um, uh, uh, Louise Jameson played Leela. And, um, uh, and it was like all television programs, but perhaps even more so with Doctor Who, every shot had to be very carefully worked out. Every scene, bit by bit, was put together. Uh, it, it's a, uh, um, a series of snip, snippets really put together by the uh, editors and the director. And the director was probably the only person that envisaged or could envisage at the end of the day that the, 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 the pace and the flow of the production that he wanted, you know. And um, uh, I remember uh, uh, we would have these meetings with Pennant and um, uh, we'd have the whole production people there and the meetings would go on for hours and hours into the evening you know just then we come to the next scene kind of thing and I I would have a plan that I'd drawn up laid out of the sets and um, the, the visual effects designer was there uh, Matt Irvin who had a mountain of things to do for the production and seemed to enjoy every moment of it and um, we would go through it shot by shot and, uh, you know, we say, well, that's one for you, Matt, or, and he'd say, that's one for you, Austin, and this kind of thing. And, um, and you'd be making scribbling notes. And, and I was getting really worried that, that these meetings would be so detailed that, uh, that we wouldn't have time actually in the end to do anything because we were that silence. <laughs> but we did. And, um, uh, and we, um, we made, uh, I remember the, the forest, um, on the stage at Ealing and we would shoot some scenes on, on the stages, the film stages, and then transfer the whole set back into the studios at Television Centre with other sets and overnight changes of sets and that kind of thing. And, um, uh, and uh, the, um, yeah, it, it, it came together in the end and um, it was just a pleasure to, to be involved with. And I remember the, the the newspapers the next day were full of this thing, Doctor Who, Doctor Who's new uh, companion um, pictures of Leela on it, you know, and um, that sort of thing. Um, it, it got enormous publicity at the time. And um, yeah, and, and uh, uh, I suppose at this point, I, I'd really like to pay tribute to uh, Pennant Roberts, who was the director, and, and as I said, I'd worked with him before. And uh, Pennant, sadly, is, is no longer with us. 
uh, and um, uh, he was uh, Pennant was uh, a champion of all things Welsh, and he would uh, would suddenly burst into Welsh, which I didn't understand, and um, uh, and he was incredibly cool, incredibly well organised, and he really cared about what he was doing, and he. Um, uh, he, I know the, the actors were very, very fond of him, uh, as we all were, and the, um, it, he was very sensitive with the actors, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that uh, had he lived a bit longer, he would have gone on to, to be one of the really, really big star names. Was it nice to work with you know, a director like Pennant again? Because I imagine you already have some sort of shorthand and know how each other work and what you expect from one another. Pennant was a very, very one of these kind of guys that you, um, you, you immediately took a liking to, you, that you kind of knew that you'd get along with. He was very easygoing, but I mean, incredibly meticulous about what he was doing. So yeah, we, we got on fine. I, I liked him very much. You mentioned the visual effects designer, Matt Irvin there. With something like that, how much input do you have as a production designer on the look of the visual effects aspects uh, in particular something like uh, the doctor's head on the mountain that was down to Matt that uh, he, he did that he took, took a plaster cast of uh, Tom Baker's face uh, to produce that um, yeah I mean you'd know what, what each other was doing in case you know in case either of you thought you should be doing something of words <laughs> um, but uh, no he was uh, it was very good it was we just seemed to everyone seemed to it was a good team Good team. The, the producer Philip Hinchcliffe gave people a lot of freedom. Uh, he, he was a very good producer um, who just um, really let you have a lot, of, a lot of rope, you know. The story had a wonderful range of sets, you know, everything from jungles to spaceships. That must be quite nice as a designer to come across something like that every now and again, which is so wide ranging. The BBC kind of expected you to do everything you know that you could um if, if a, a light entertainment show came up uh, uh you know les dawson how it was put on once and I, I thought he was incredible uh he was the funniest man i've ever met i mean he just he just was funny you know he just couldn't help it and uh it, it was great you know and they'd come up with some uh ideas at the last moment or within a few days of recording like, can you do the grand staircase from Gone with the Wind by next week? You know, you say, no, we haven't got any money. We spent up. Say, oh, I'll think of something else. And said, you know, <laughs> yeah. He said, yes, we're, um, we're going to do, um, we're going to, uh, I want you to do a, a council house bedroom with, with, loaded with chemistry equipment, all the Bunsen burners and files and bubbling, this, that, and the other. And we're going to do a thing about Frankenstein, you see. And so um, he would come on and he would say, oh, I did all this. He said, um, he said, I've got one GCSE. I live in a council house and I've made this monster. And he was <laughs> And then he produced from under a cloth the, um, the mother-in-law or something. <laughs> So how would you found yourself at the BBC in the first place? Well, it's um, the, the, the 1960s was a time of great optimism and opportunity. And um, uh, I suddenly, well, I found myself going for an interview at Television Centre with the, the then head of design, Richard Levin. Now, um, what I didn't know at the time was that uh, and, I, and I knew nothing at all about television, uh, was that uh, he strongly held the belief that television was a, a, a medium of its own and that a lot of people that worked in television at that time were from the background of the film industry or the theatre. And he, he thought television was something quite different. And... and in a sense, he was very right because it, it was a complete game changer. Uh, we all knew the effect it had on, on uh, uh, cinemas and theatres. Uh, every town in the country had a, 
a cinema, or at least one cinema, or theatres, uh, and um, uh, it had a profound effect on things like that when people would sit at home in their living room and enjoy television. And to that effect, what he did was he organised a course for people who hadn't worked in television. Uh, and there were people who were trained as architects, interior designers, um, uh, illustrators, furniture designers, and, and so on, and myself included. And um, we, we, we embarked in 1963 on a course. Uh, the course didn't last that long. And we were um, uh, given a very small program eventually after a series of lectures, a small program to design. Now, at that time, uh, television was black and white. There was only BBC and ITV. Uh, everything was live and the, um, uh, the BBC had forged very good relationships with all countries all around the world who were starting their own television companies. The, um, uh, and indeed ran production courses for producers and directors from all around the world. And uh, my, my, I was given a, a little production to do on a, on a shoestring budget with a, a gentleman who was a Belgian television director. And I went to see him and he said, uh, I, uh, he said, well, uh, just build me a, a rough, sort of a rough, very poor bedroom. And I said, yeah, okay, um, what sort of shots were you thinking of getting in and what would tell me about it? And he said, oh, don't worry about that. Uh, the, the, the cameras and everything, that, that's down to me. Uh, you, you just give me a bedroom, you know, so. So um, uh, he, we did, well, I got some bits of old stock scenery that we had, flats which had torn wallpaper and all sorts of things. And uh, we made this small set. And he said, uh, as English wasn't his first language, he'd written a play which, uh, which had only three words in it. And that was yes, no, and sesquipedalian. And he got a, a couple of actors, I think, who probably did it for next to nothing or nothing. And throughout the little play, they, they would just use the words yes and no. Uh, and the various intonations you could get on that. And, and only once in the play did they use the word sesquipedalian. And um, I found out afterwards that, in fact, he, he wasn't a beginner at all. He was actually a very experienced uh, a guy who produced lots of programs in Belgium and have won all sorts of awards and some of them very, very big awards, but um, he was a very clever fellow. <laughs> and so uh, that, was, that was one of the first things that I ever did. And um, uh, when we sort of graduated, as it were, from, from this, uh, this introduction to television, uh, we were given small programs to look after, to, to caretake, if you like. And I remember I was given um, Panorama to look after, another, another live program. And the, um, off I went down to Lime Grove Studios, to Studio G, as I remember. It was a very difficult studio. It was a very long kind of bottleneck of a studio. And it, the program would be live that evening at probably about 8.30 in the evening. And it wasn't until late in the afternoon that you got some kind of rough idea what the content of the program was. At that time, uh, there were, uh, they, the BBC had a, in, in a lot of new graduates straight from university uh, who were working on, on, you know, productions. And uh, um, some of them had got uh, degrees in geology and that kind of thing and whatever and um, chemistry and all the sort of things like this. Anyway, this young chap came down and said, right, okay, uh, the running order for this evening is we've got uh, four items on. Um, we've got uh, uh, a program about the country's wealth, about the, the gold reserves and this kind of thing. And to that end, I've been onto the Bank of England and they're going to loan us some uh, ingots of gold for the production. 
So uh, he said, that's the first, if you could just pile them all up or do something with them, there you see. And then the second item we've got um, is about meat, which is not fit for human consumption. And I've organized some, um, he'd organized some sides of beef and pork that have been condemned to hang in the studio, you see. And so the third item is about pornographic magazines. So I'm going to get some, mag if you can display them discreetly along here. Right. And the, the fourth item is uh, we've got the Prime Minister of Israel coming in for an interview. So I thought, right, okay, fine. Well, so no sooner than this happened, um, um, the doors opened and a man came in pulling a little trolley piled high with gold ingots on it, solid gold ingots. Uh, where, where do you want this, mate? Uh, uh, just down there, please, you know. And um, so we started piling these up. Then another trolley arrived full of solid gold ingots. And we piled them up. And we, I thought, well, um, what, what we'll do is we'll make a kind of like a chimney stack of these things because they're incredibly heavy. Can I, can I, can I just hold one, please? So as you're probably familiar with gold ingots uh, there, um, the, uh, they are very ridiculously heavy, you know, much more than they look. And I was getting a bit worried about the weight on the studio floor. I knew there were rooms below and I didn't know what the load bearing on the, on the floor was. So anyway, they kept on coming and I'm piling up these bricks uh, in, into this sort of structure. I thought, well, if we can get dear old Richard Dimbleby standing next to them and, and the gold in, in shot at the same time, that would be good. And um, uh, so did that um, and um, got all the studio ready. And just before the, before the kickoff, um, the Prime Minister of Israel and his entourage came in they were sort of uh, Israeli James Bonds, like bodyguards all around, you know. Whatever. And um, I could see them standing, standing there, sort of whispering to each other, looking at this great big pile of this, this ridiculous assembly of miscellaneous, miscellaneous stuff around the studio. And I could see them talking about it. And I, I thought, well, they're probably thinking, no, they can't be real. They can't be real. They're props, you know. Anyway, before you know it, uh, what happens is the, um, it comes up to the, you're on the air. Uh, it, it's, it's on and there's dear Richard Dimbleby uh, talking about the country's wealth and saying this, this stack of gold is, it represents, I think, I can't remember, it was 200th of the entire wealth of this country. Each one of these bars is worth thousands and thousands, I can't remember how much now, but it was worth a hell of a lot. And um, then he, he gradually goes through the show with consummate ease and professionalism and seamlessly fine. Until all of a sudden, the next thing you know is the, the closing credits are going up and uh, the, the Richard Dimbleby saying good evening to everyone. And, um, uh, and then the uh, studio lights go off and the house lights come on and then the scene of absolute chaos uh, issues with people putting away cameras and uh, uh, winding up cables and letting down lights and all this kind of thing. So I grabbed this young fellow and I said, um, what, what, what's happening about this lot? And he said, oh, well, the Bank of England said they'd come and collect it back. And so I said, well, when? We, you know, there's going to be a program in here, so another program. To which he said, well, I'll go and find out. So he goes to the telephone, he comes back and says, um, I've been on to them, but, but the, 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 they've all gone home. The Bank of England's gone home. Well, at least the fellow I've been dealing with isn't there. Uh, so I said, well, we, we can't, there's more gold here than in the great train robbery. What, what, what are we gonna do with it? We can't send it to props. Um, you know, so there's gonna be a program in here tomorrow. They're gonna, they wanna paint the floor and get on with the scenery. Uh, so it disappears again, comes back and says, I've been on to them. I've been on to someone. They can't come tonight. They, they said they'd come in the morning. Can we look after it overnight? <laughs> so eventually to resolve the situation, a man was called who uh, was the, I think his title was probably house manager or premises manager or something like that. And he came down and he knew of a cupboard 
uh, where the cleaners kept all their brooms and, and mops and buckets and things. So the buckets and mops were taken out. The gold was piled in this little cupboard type room and the door was locked safely and he took charge of the key until the morning. So that was a great chunk of the country's wealth was locked in a broom cupboard at Lime Grove Studios. And um, uh, they got their gold back. Well, I've got one piece of it here. They got almost all of it back, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> and of course, you soon find yourself working on established programmes such as uh, Zed Cars, Dixon and Doc Green, which also had the challenge that they were done sort of as live at the time. There was no recording, there was no retakes of anything. It was the whole nation watching and they got colossal audiences. And I remember one such programme was, was that really crossed the public's imagination was Zed Cars. And um, in the studio, the Ford Motor Company, I think had given them a, a, a I think it was a Zephyr or a Zodiac with the bonnet cut off and the engine taken out and just, just the back end of the car, the windscreen taken out. And that was Zed Victor One. And the atmosphere in the studio getting on, I'm sure that when I looked out on the road, the main road outside, the traffic had disappeared almost. I think everyone, the whole nation was watching, you know. And there was talk of audiences of 26 and a half million people and all this sort of thing. And it was live. And uh, the, the minutes tick up towards eight o'clock. The floor manager says, good luck, everyone. And uh, we're off. And uh, 10, 9, 8, which all seemed to me to make it even more pregnant, the the atmosphere in there, the tension. And then the Zed Cars theme, Johnny Todd comes on and you're on and that's it. Well, what happens is if you're designing a, a live television show, you would put, say, for argument's sake, scene one at one end of the studio with a couple of cameras and scene two at the far end of the studio with cameras ready for that. So it could go seamlessly from one to the other. And then camera, scene one lot cameras will go to scene three, which would be nearby, set that kind of setup. Well, there was one such episode where the cameras got the cables, the cameras were huge and they had great cables after them. And the cameras got tangled up in the middle of the studio and they couldn't get onto the next scene. So the floor manager, said to the, the two policemen sitting in front of him, said Victor one, just, just keep going. And so the two of them sat there and they said, you are, get on, never happen. <laughs> they carried on like that, get away, nah, like, <laughs> they carried on like that. And until the, um, until the floor manager said, okay, that's fine, you're great. And, um, uh, and you would move on. So there was the, the propensity for all sorts of things that happened. I think in the, we got used to in the 1970s of seeing a boom in shot, cameras crashing into the set, uh, props getting knocked over, actors forgetting their lines. I had a, I remember also there was, um, I had a doorknob, one actor making his entrance, pulled the doorknob too hard and it came off in his hand and he couldn't get into the set. and with a bit of uh, improvisation, wound his way through the cameras and in through the fourth wall, as it were, and suddenly appeared behind the people who were <laughs> supposed to be responding to this person who just entered. And um, a, a lot of these things, I think you got away with that the people at home wouldn't realize that you'd actually somehow got round them, you know. And I imagine it would have been about this sort of time that both BBC Two and Colour Television came in. As a designer, of course, the sets you designed for black and white television aren't actually black and white. How would then designing for colour television change perhaps how you approach the, the look or maybe the sort of feel of a set? Not much, not much really, except that you can use colour. And, and nowadays, um, when, I mean, in, in, before that, it was, it was very much a um, make do and mend. It was kind of very much a cobbled together sort of television. Um, and uh, nothing of the sophistication that, that occurs nowadays in the digital era. 
And the um, uh, nowadays they use color. You know, uh, you will see uh, television programs where the color is used as as a as a tool in itself. I think in the early days we, we didn't quite cotton on to that, and we we just produced uh, just photographic color, as it were. I suppose that an early colour production for you would have been Colditz, when of course you were the series original designer. With something like that, when of course it was an incredible build, how early would you be brought on board for, for that? A long, a long time beforehand, coming on board for something like that. It was a wonderful experience. Um, but I must say one thing, we, uh, the actual uh, courtyard, which filled one of the stages at Ealing, completely, and it was still smaller than actually Colditz. Um, the, the, uh, the actual exterior of the court, courtyard was designed by Peter Seddon, and I designed, I designed the floor and the interiors sort of thing for the first episode. And the, um, uh, the, it was a wonderful experience because I remember uh, Pat Reed who, who wrote the cold story and actually escaped from cold it's teaching me how to to make a tunnel and that kind of thing and how you construct a tunnel and all this and meeting some absolutely amazing people um uh, it, people that um had actually been in cold and, uh, and and their stories that they would tell but were just amazing so it, it was a great experience and um uh, uh, and I remember being invited to the Imperial War Museum because they had an exhibition afterwards of, about Colditz and um, meeting a lot of these characters. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was great fun. It was great fun. Jerry Glaster, the producer, was, um, was a, 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 a great guy. He was very, um, very cool, very patient, very quiet and gave it a tremendous amount of freedom. And uh, Jerry was a, a, an ex-Spitfire pilot from World War II uh, with, with a, a, an amazing record. And um, yeah, he, he was a great, uh, great producer to work with, yeah. And we did, we did uh, call the second series of Cold Lips. And then we, 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 together we did uh, Secret Army, uh, which I was the lead designer on that as well. And um, Secret Army was a, was a, was a super uh, thing to do as well, because I knew personally people in Belgium who had been involved in that, um, uh, the underground movement, and, and I'd known them for years beforehand. And um, it, it was like paying, paying them homage as well. And um, I remember uh, I, I went to I had to design the, the, the main set that will appear in just about every episode of the cafe. And I went with the um, script editor and the production unit manager to, to Brussels looking for locations and just information because um, everything had to be, as far as I was concerned, just right. You, you look for the proportion of the windows and doors was different. All the, dressings would be different and uh, to try and get that sort of same flavor that same atmosphere into the studio um, and I think one thing about being a designer is that you you didn't want to intrude upon the action or the actors so you wouldn't make a set that was too glaringly obviously a set as it were and, um, and I looked around Brussels for an old cafe just to get some information about it and what they were like and I couldn't find one they were all very modern they were all all chrome and glass and uh, lighting and whatever and uh, I was getting a bit worried about this and, and uh, miraculously on the last evening I was there I was also getting very worried that the drawing dates were coming near I had to get all the construction drawings done designed drawn up and into the workshops and uh, on the very last evening there, I stumbled across, I can't believe how lucky it was, upon this little old cafe place. And I went in and, um, and it was wonderful. It was terrific. It was run by an elderly couple. 
and uh, they explained to me that they were uh, about to retire. They'd been there. Their cafe was, people didn't go there because it was too old fashioned and uh, they were about to retire. And so I, um, I rushed back and got the production manager and the, and the script editor back and said, you've got to come and see this. It's absolutely, it's, it's gold, it's magic. And um, uh, they came back and, uh, uh, and, and the old couple said that they were retiring. And I said, but what's going to happen to all the, um, all the stuff in the cafe? And they said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, I'd like to buy everything in the cafe. And they couldn't believe their luck. And I couldn't believe my luck. We bought all the chairs, tables, the advertising material. In Belgium, they played this game of darts, which is a small darts board about that big. They had one of those on the wall. Can, can we have that as well, please? You know, all this sort of stuff. And we shipped it all back to, to London. And I based the wooden panelling that they had on their walls on the, the stock set of the cafe. And um, so we, we got away with it by the skin of our teeth. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was just good. <laughs> of course, fantastic looks the series. And then eventually they did a second series where the owner of the cafe had moved up in the world and he got a very grand cafe in the Grand Place in, in Brussels. So I, I talked my way into going back again to have, get information and to look at this, this cafe and, um, uh, and take information about buildings and that kind of thing and film locations. So it was, it was a great uh, uh, series to work on. The, the RAF Museum at Hendon were our technical advisors and um, uh, and I could go along there. I, uh, one episode, I remember, we had to do a crash Wellington bomber. And I can remember going along taking measurements of the inside of this geodesic structure that they were made of. And um, it was just one of those incredible moments that they, they allowed me in where the public aren't normally allowed to go inside this plane. And I scrambled along the fuselage and over the main spar and into the tail gunners bit. And it was quite dark. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, there but for the grace of God go I, you know, born a few years earlier, would have been, you know, that kind of thing. It was just a, a great experience altogether. Of course, whilst you were making the series, the events that it was depicting were very much living history. You know, many viewers would have lived through it or, or fought in the war themselves. From your point of view, that must have put a great deal of pressure on you to get it right, because so many could have picked out details and, and said, you know, that was wrong. Yes, they were indeed. Yeah, yeah. And it was a great pleasure. It was, it was great to know them and great, great to meet people like that. And, uh, and, and also, uh, perhaps it's happening with me a bit, but um, people's memories do get a bit blurred as well, what they think they can remember and what they thought happened and that kind of thing, you know. So, but it, it, was, it was just a wonderful experience to meet people like that. Is it a coincidence that you designed so many historical dramas? You know, is history a, a passion and interest for you? Uh, I've got a son who's an historian as well, which I think came from his early days of watching things like that. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's something I still... Uh, history is very, very important. Of course, you've worked across so many different departments and productions. Is there any one particular genre or period that you particularly enjoyed designing? Well, for me, um, I, I, I did prefer the 1930s and 40s. Um, uh, but uh, I did find that uh, I'm really not a science fiction designer. I, I would prefer to do plays and um, modern plays, really, or period plays. I suppose one of the challenges of being a staff designer is that you're brought in maybe just for the odd one or two episodes of an established series. So something like that, how do you make it your own or is perhaps a challenge to maintain the continuity of what's gone before? Even with the stock set, it's, uh, it depends on the shots that the director wants to get, um, which might need manipulating, moving this, that and the other, or adding, adding bits on or whatever, you know. Um, so uh, you were in charge of the, the design for that programme uh, as well as your new sets, yeah. 
what um what we would do oh hang on a second uh, i've got something i wanted to, oh i've got something i wanted to show you yeah. um when when they when they cleared when they cleared the studio away after doctor who they were throwing things away like mad and i delved into the um into the waste paper bin and, and save that, which is the uh, picture that it was a caption they used on Doctor Who, uh, which they superimposed figures over. Uh, and that was in the bin, so I, I, I rescued it. So that was the, the jungle. <laughs> but with, um, with uh, uh, producing scenery, what would happen is that you would draw these very complicated uh, plans and elevations uh, for the construction people, uh, which will be yes, this, this is uh, this is the scene from this is from Colditz, and uh, it's one of the construction drawings there. And um, the, the the thing was that not everyone is happy reading elevations and plans. And um, so we would also do uh, little models like his uh, <laughs> dust off it. Here's a little model of a set, which would be helpful for the lighting man with the ceiling pieces and what shots you could get through from what angles and that kind of thing. And, uh, but I, I used to say later on to students that, um, it's all very well doing that, but it doesn't tell you anything about the visual identity of that you're going to see on the screen. So if you can draw visuals, uh, if you can draw little sketches of what the set would actually look like, um, th that helps everyone. The directors love that. Um, what you don't want is to get to the studio and the directors say, oh, I didn't think it was going to look like that, you know. Um, <laughs> so. I've got some. I've got some visuals somewhere, but I can't put my hand on them at the moment. From Doctor Who, and um, and some drawings of the TARDIS and things like that. But I don't know where they are at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a, a great experience, and and uh, uh, it, it was a love hate thing. Sometimes you think, why am I doing this? The pressure was quite intense. You were responsible for spending an awful lot of money. And um, uh, and other times when you just absolutely loved it, you know, which was most of the times, really, to be honest. <laughs> Another drum which I was keen to mention, which is perhaps more relevant now than ever, was Survivors, of which you were once again the lead designer. But that seems to be more sort of location set dressing than actual designing sets. Was that uh, something of a welcome change? I was the lead designer on it, and so I designed some of the sets that would follow through in each episode. Um, uh, one of one of the issues with that is that um, uh, that if the if the world was deserted, it wouldn't take very long, I think, for nature to start taking over, and you get uh, through the pavements on the streets, you start getting plants growing and that kind of thing. And that that that's a bit of a, an issue with location work for that. But but you know, survivors was about. Um, a pandemic that spread throughout the world and the opening credits were of um i remember were of a, a a laboratory somewhere in the far east uh and someone knocking over a file of nasty on the floor and then airplanes taking off all around the world it couldn't possibly happen too far-fetched this was 45 years ago too far-fetched, couldn't write it, no. <laughs> Absolutely amazing when you think about it. Certainly quite the case of uh, art foreshadowing life. But uh, these days you've uh, moved away from the BBC uh, and you're, you're an artist working mainly in oils and etching. Is that something that you've always done? Yes, it's, it's what I studied and which, uh, which I loved. Um, ever, ever since I was a child, I've, I've drawn pictures. And um, uh, when I was very small, we moved, we moved from Yorkshire down to London next to, next to an aerodrome. 
which was occupied by the American Air Force. And as kids, you judged each other's wealth and cued us by the pile of American comics they'd managed to scrounge off a wee airman. And um, uh, we would wait, lie and wait, you know, got any gum chum and have you got any American comics? And they were so generous. They would give us the, these comics. I can still remember the smell of them. And um, I thought uh, that um, I didn't have many, but some, some kids have big piles of these comics, you see. So I, I did the obvious thing, I make your own. So my mum used to buy me some exercise books and pen and ink. And I thought it was great. You could actually do little squares and you could, you could make up a story. There was no plan. I didn't have a plot. I just made it up as I went along. And, um, uh, but, but my drawings uh, paled into insignificance compared with the American uh, comic drafts and made these wonderful drawings. And um, so I, I, I remember trying to think, I'm, I've got to improve this. I've got to, you know, make the drawings better. And eventually it went to art school. Uh, this, um, and uh, when, I, when I first went, the very first day, I think it was, I went to the BBC many years later, they handed me a shop pad and the shop pad had little windows across the pad. And I looked at it and I thought, this is what I was doing as a kid. <laughs> I thought, this is, um, this is just amazing. This is what I, I you know, it's like, it's like a comic, each, um, uh, each shot in the production sort of thing. And um, so, uh, yeah, that was great. Um, uh, yeah, love, love doing things like that, yeah. It must be nice to focus solely on your artwork rather than having to sort of fit it in between various design jobs now. Yeah, I, 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 I just paint now. I paint and make prints and draw now. And uh, that's my main preoccupation at the moment, yes. I noticed amongst your work, you do a lot of landscapes. Is that a subject that particularly interests you? Yeah, the, the, um, uh, well, but at the moment, because in lockdown, I've been doing lots of still life painting. And, um, but I, I do a lot of landscapes. And of course, the, the most interesting thing of all is the human face. Uh, as someone once said, the human face is the, the, the most interesting landscape in the world. And each one has its component parts, but they're all different. And um, yeah, that's the, the greatest challenge, I think, is, is drawing people and drawing human beings. I imagine that's something that is a, an ongoing exploration that you continue to enjoy. But uh, I, I wanted just to take you back to your time at the BBC very quickly. Who were the people that you particularly learnt from or were your peers as you went through the BBC? We, when, we, when we first went there, um, we were paired off with a, a senior designer, uh, someone of great experience who would, we, we would just be in tow, you know, kind of thing and help them and assist them and whatever. So some of the, the, the great, uh, there were some great uh, designers there at the BBC at the time. And I worked with them. Um, uh, a designer called Richard Henry, who was very well known, uh, very well respected at the time. And uh, there was Sue Spence, uh, th there, was a, there was Tony Abbott, uh, there was a, a whole, uh, Fanny Taylor, there, there was a whole succession of people who were probably the greatest television designers in the world at the time, yeah. With the mention of some fantastic designers, I think that's a lovely moment to end on. So I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time, Austin. I know we've but scratched the surface of your work, but it's been a real joy. So thank you very much. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.